The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Some people are getting away with murder, literally. Tonight, criminologist Michael Arntfield on why so many cases seem to fall through the cracks and his new book, How to Solve a Cold Case. Then, Nan Kiwanuka talks to Bobby Ann Brady, the first independent candidate elected in Ontario since the 1990s. And speaking of the newly elected, are there any MPPs at Queen's Park right now? We'll do a civics primer on who does what during this limbo between the end of the election and the next sitting of the Legislative Assembly. It's Thursday, June 16th, and that's all next on The Agenda. To watch American primetime cop shows, you'd think that few murders nowadays go unsolved. And that's exactly when you need to remember those shows are fiction. The reality is different. Criminologist and Western University professor Michael Arntfield captures a fuller picture in his new book. It's called How to Solve a Cold Case and Everything Else You Wanted to Know About Catching Killers. And he's with us now on the line from London, Ontario. Michael, it's good to have you on the program again. How are you doing? Doing well, Steve. Good to be back. Thank you. Not at all. Let's start by showing a graph from your book, if we can, here. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring this up. This is the percentage of murder cases in the U.S. that have been solved since 1965. Back then, more than 90% of cases were closed, meaning the police either found the killer or the killer killed themselves or something. It was resolved. But over the years, and I'll just describe this in a bit of detail for those who are listening on podcast, we see a clear decline in the line of cases solved from 90% back in the day to just around 60%, a little over 60% today. Um, let's start there. Why the big change? Well, nobody really knows. And to be clear, Steve, 2020, uh, the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, uh, which basically allows police departments to report their resolved cases to the Justice Department, began in 1929. Um, and 2020, so nearly 100 years later, marked the lowest solved rate in history at just over 50%. So one in two murders going unsolved. So uh, that decline continues. And there's a few reasons specific to 2020. Um, Canada had the same issue. Uh, but in the United States, um, there's a couple of theories that I, that I proffer in the book, of course. Uh, one is uh, that um, police have become over-reliant on methodologies and technologies such as DNA. And there's been sort of an erosion of traditional hard scrabble, boots on the ground, detective work. Um, of, obviously, you can see the, the plummet really picks up uh, right around the time the DNA comes into effect. So uh, DNA is not the panacea uh, that I think people think it is. The second theory is that, uh, and we know this, uh, murder numbers, murder stats, uh, traditionally have been really more of estimates. The Uniform Crime Reporting Program I just mentioned is uh, voluntary in the United States. And several, I mean, and by several hundreds of police departments never submitted their data to the FBI. So when you see published homicide rates of per 100,000 people, those numbers reflect only the police departments are reporting. What we've done at the Murder Accountability Project at murderdata.org is we've gone and found all of the blind spots throughout the country and through freedom of information, uh, obtained uh, their historic clearance rate, added it to the federal clearance rate, and the numbers are worse. So what's happening is uh, we feel we have a fuller picture now, and the, the picture is that um, it, it's been declining. Well, let's do an example from this side of the border. The Toronto Police Service says they clear 80% of their murder cases. Number one, do you believe them? Number two, is that a good number? It's a very good number. Um, and this is largely what we see in terms of the overall national average. Uh, some police services remain, have been and remain very effective in, in, in resolving uh, and clearing homicides. But you have um, recurringly... Uh, substandard, suboptimal 
police agencies, law enforcement agencies, uh, whose clearance rates consistently 20, 30 percent. Uh, these add up and bring down the whole national average is, is, is what we're finding both in Canada and in the U.S. And what do you think the Toronto police are doing better than, say, other police services, which are doing those things presumably worse? It all comes down to resources, human resources, uh, financial resources. We consistently see uh, law enforcement agencies that prioritize, regardless of who the victim is, regardless of the political climate, who consistently prioritize and standardize their investigations uh, will have a superior clearance rate. What we're seeing in, in some case studies in the United States, again, with these uh, agencies that have you know, 20, 30 percent clearance rates, number one, they have a tremendous number of murders. But number two, um, detectives don't even have access to a consistent vehicle and a motor pool. So they're often waiting hours just to be able to get to a crime scene. Uh, so something as simple as um, having a, a, an adequate supply of, of, of unmarked units Again, at the, at the other end, the bigger picture is um, the more effective police work and, and a higher clearance rate. Hmm. Michael, I suspect everybody thinks they know the answer to this because they watch American cop shows, but I want to hear from an expert what it really means. When you say a case is a cold case, how little progress over what period of time does a police service get to before they consider it a cold case? Great question. Uh, and I think a lot of people want to know this. Cold case is really a, um, a cop and media coinage. It has no legal or forensic standing, but homicide scholars in general uh, and law enforcement can, in, for the most part, uh, have generally come to agree on a, a three-pronged criteria before you can use that term. Number one, the original investigator is no longer attached to the case. So there's a, a break in the institutional continuity of the case. They've either retired or died or, or, or been reassigned. Uh, the second is that there is no outstanding uh, analysis or lab work of any kind that is, is holding up progress. You're not waiting on the DNA test. You're not waiting on a ballistics test. There's, there's, there's no paperwork forthcoming. And the third is that there has not been an update uh, to what we call the murder book or the investigative chronology uh, in over a year. There's been no interview in a year. Uh, there's been no uh, re-canvassing or, or, or nothing done on the case in 12 months. So you can see using that criteria, uh, a case could technically be cold uh, in 13 months. Right. All right. With that definition now in place, let's do a little clip from the book here in which you say, victims and killers have different market values depending on where how and why the crimes occur. Welcome to Homicide Economics 101. Let's pick that apart, Michael. What do you mean by that? Well, this goes back to what we were just discussing in that uh, we clearly see uh, a two-tiered approach uh, to the investigation of some murders. And, and some of this is beyond the control of police. And I've talked a lot about this with respect to the uh, Nova Scotia massacre and the we see this as a consistent issue, responding to violent crime as well as investigating violent crime in communities that rely in Canada on contract policing, whether that be a contract uh, fulfilled by the RCMP or the OPP or the Sûreté de Québec. In the U.S., uh, we, I'll give you an example that uh, is in the book. Uh, in Chicago, for instance, which has, uh, as I think we all know, a, a, a tremendous violent crime problem, so much so, and the clearance rate is consistently so low uh, that what was happening was uh, disproportionately among people of color. Uh, if the victim's family could not be identified, or the next of kin could not be identified regarding a murder victim uh, in about 72 hours, and this was exposed in, in Chicago uh, Magazine uh, about 10 years ago, this practice, uh, those murders would be recoded uh, using, again, uniform crime reporting to either undetermined or accidental. So those don't get reported as, as homicides to the FBI in order to uh, artificially deflate the annual homicide rate. But what happens is, and there's a whole section in the book on, on this problem of what we call concealed homicides, that record never shows up anywhere. That case never occurred, not as a homicide. That victim wasn't counted. And what you've got is a killer 
uh, that nobody's looking for because their crime has been coded as something else. Hmm. I want to ask you about an expression that we've obviously heard a great deal about over the last couple of years, and that is defund the police. And it has taken on, I think it's taken on a, a, a sort of broader meaning than the strict, narrow definition of, you know, take the police's money away, in as much as it's let's fund the police to do other things or let's take the money that we now give to the police and give it to other agencies who perhaps are better able to do that work. How does solving murders fit into the whole defund the police narrative? Well, I talk a lot about that narrative in the book. Um, and uh, I'm a proponent for, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the pages of the book, uh, a gut job. Use, uh, retool, uh, rebuild, redisperse uh, a lot of the money more effectively. In terms of cold cases, uh, I can count on one hand the number of law enforcement agencies in Canada that have a full-time dedicated uh, cold case unit uh, with properly and that's properly staffed, and where investigators just aren't sort of dabbling in cold cases uh, in the event that they have spare time. Uh, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity. This narrative to look at. Uh, what police can do better and where resources should be dispersed. Uh, I mentioned previously, the clearance rate is directly tied to the financial and human resources devoted mm -hmm. to taking homicide investigations seriously. So and, what I hear you uh, saying you between would, the lines then is if they got away with it, the chances are they're going to continue to get away with it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the definition of, of a serial killer, regardless of motive, I mean, most people think of serial killers as um, you know, sexual uh, predators, which many of them are, but a serial killer is just, regardless of methodology or, 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 or motive, someone who kills two or more people in two separate incidents. That's it. So, uh, yeah, these are people who are not, have not been apprehended, have not been identified. Uh, and as I mentioned in the book, there's a particularly disturbing case in the suburb of Toronto where a serial killer came back to the same house three times and systematically executed members of the same family. And it wasn't until the third victim, the police even realized the first two deaths were murders. They were both misclassified again to go to, uh, or to speak to concealed homicides. Yeah, let's follow up on that. Cause I did, when I read that in the book, I thought that's crazy. How could this person not have been caught until the third murder? What, what kind of police work went into presumably declaring the first two deaths non-homicidal, which would allow this person to return to the scene of the crime, there's the three of them there, to return to the scene of the crime and murder all three members of this Harrison family. There's another case in London with a, a, a serial killer who, who scaled the exteriors of buildings. And again, his first three victims uh, were ruled uh, accidental or undetermined as well. So th this happens, I mean, it doesn't happen a lot, but uh, is, is disturbingly more frequent than I think people realize. And what happens is uh, s snap judgments are often made in busy police services when attending these scenes. The coroner attends, um, sort of looks around, looks at the nature of the injuries. A homicide will come out, largely defer to the coroner. It's by the coroner's authority that the police are even there. Uh, and a judgment call is made and a, and a bad call at that and then two a, a second bad call gets made a year or so later uh, and just a lucky break for the for the killer i suppose uh and i mean as i mentioned in the book he must have been amazed after the second murder nothing's in the paper no one's questioning him I and mean, he was an intuitive suspect these are all personal cause homicides as we say so um the system uh, has its issues, no question, and that's that's the whole inspiration for this book. Yeah, let's circle back to something you said earlier in our discussion about the over reliance on DNA evidence right now to clear cases. And and again, I'm going to pluck a quote out of the book here, in which you write: "The fact of the matter is that DNA evidence has made murder investigations and, by extension, prosecutions." something of an all-or-nothing proposition. Over-reliance on it to the exclusion of traditional investigative techniques is, however, believed to be one of the three factors that have led to a record backlog of cold cases and also to a record low murder clearance rate in the United States. It seems that DNA, for all the cases it solves, can play a negative role if relied on too much. Can you just amplify on that a bit, a bit again? And maybe in doing so, maybe tell the story of the 
of the murder case where it was the new shower curtain, not DNA evidence, but it was the new shower curtain that gave away the ghost. Right. So let's start with DNA. Um, a lot of the cases that are going uncleared have DNA, uh, but there is, I think, this stigma around investigating cases in order to gather circumstantial evidence. The term circumstantial evidence is sort of a dirty word now. Well, the reality is before uh, the late 90s, that's how cases were solved. That's how homicides were cleared before DNA. But what we see is in many of these cases, DNA is only as good as having an offender to match a crime scene sample to. And there's many very disturbing uh for instance, sexual homicides here in London that have DNA on file, cr crime scene DNA, and no offender has ever been processed into the system for the DNA data bank to, to make a match. They just sit on a shelf waiting for uh, that person to pop up on the radar of the National DNA Data Bank. So, and this, is, this comes from interacting with and having been a, a police officer for many years. It, it's sort of, there's DNA, wait for, um, wait for the check to clear, basically. Um, that leads to a blunting, again, of, I think, the instinctual uh, investigative work that was done in the past. I give some examples of some cold case task forces that uh, had no DNA and, again, returned to uh, good old-fashioned detective work. Now, I should qualify that genomics or familial DNA uh, is an absolute game changer. I mean, this technology is changing by uh, the week uh, so much so that they're now referring to the DNA data bank the police have traditionally relied on as um, legacy DNA technologies because uh, the future is in uh, leveraging, again, family trees through these private labs. No, fair enough. We'll talk about that more in a bit. But, but I do want to hear the story about the shower curtain and the detective noticing the brand new shower curtain, and that's what ultimately got them to solve the case. Well, there's a few... Um, so this is a well-known Toronto uh, murder. Uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous teamwork that went into this. And although the prosecutor at the time uh, said that it was one of the more difficult cases to foreseeably uh, or to bring to court, uh, the offender in that case was Michael Briere. And uh, he was one of several males spoken to by police doing a door-to-door -door canvas looking for voluntary DNA samples. Uh, he refused, uh, which, given the circumstances of the case, murder of a, of a small child, uh, obviously was deemed to be somewhat concerning. He didn't make any, any sort of uh, logical argument or, or um, you know, put up the usual political gestures. So uh, before police left, they also noticed that there was a clearly incongruous brand new shower curtain visible uh, in the one bathroom of this of this small apartment. The crease marks still visible, totally uh, not in keeping with the remainder of the of the slovenly conditions in which this individual was living. That's a clue. So uh, this individual was placed under police surveillance uh, and ultimately it was determined that the old shower curtain that matched the rest of the apartment was uh, used to wrap the dismembered remains of, of the girl. And really, that was, that was what broke the case, is that single observation. Now, you talked about forensic genealogy a second ago, so let's pick up on that, because that was at the forefront of the solving of a, uh, a very high-profile case, the so-called Golden State Killer. Uh, let's start with Michelle McNamara. She was uh, central to this story. Why don't you pick it up from there? So, Ms. McNamara... Uh, now deceased. This, this book was published posthumously. Uh, number one, coined the term the Golden State Killer. Uh, this was an offender that had multiple monikers uh, and was poorly understood, and including my police who didn't know that uh, these crimes with different modus operandi in different areas could be the same individual who was just uh, varying his, his, his attacks. In some cases, he would, he would murder the occupants. In other cases, he would just ransack uh, homes. Uh, and at the time, the understanding of suspectology and, and criminal uh, analysis uh, allowed this individual who happened to be a police officer to get away with it. Uh, McNamara uh, dug into this case with a level of rigor not seen before, coined a, a term that the media could sort of work with, um, and ultimately helped steward 
uh, this, this series of cases, this mystery uh, toward a uh, genealogist who really sort of uh, made this the landmark case for using familial DNA or what we now call genomics and, and identifying an offender who's not in the DNA data bank uh, but whose relatives have participated in, in one of these family tree programs and have then shared that information publicly. And uh, again, I don't think people fully understand this. People think this sounds very frightening that you, you, know, you do ancestry and then you know the police could come to your to your house or, or that this is instantaneous. It's not. It's months of work. Uh, and then the potential match needs to be corroborated by DNA. Uh, obtained from a suspect either by way of DNA warrant or by way of public discard, which is how um, they were able to uh, make an arrest in this case. Well, what was interesting about Michelle was she was not a criminologist. She did not have police training. She was a writer, and she was particularly interested in this case. And it, it raises for me a question about whether police services, whether police detectives either appreciate or would rather not have Average citizens, journalists, uh, you know, uh, sleuths on their spare time uh, get involved in helping them clear cases. What do you think? Well, she did ultimately partner with Paul Holes, who was a police officer, and, and uh, obviously they had a, a partnership that worked out uh, very well. I talk about this in the in the book, uh, and I raise the question whether true crime helps or hurts cold cases, and the answer is both. I think uh, true crime can serve a very valuable role in McNamara's case um, being really sort of the paragon of this, uh, can serve a valuable role in keeping cases in the public eye, uh, keeping pressure on police to maintain momentum, uh, and uh, ideally ferreting out uh, new, new information, new tips, which we've seen in a couple of cases uh, in the US. So I. I think as long as these stories are being told, preferably with uh, some respect for the victims and, and with some degree of taste, uh, there's some exceptions to that, obviously, and I mentioned them in the book. Um, I think everyone is on the same team here. So uh, McNamara's book is, is a great example of, of how, again, uh, that interest in true crime, that earnest interest and um, a willingness to do the work the police don't have the bandwidth to do, uh, assuming the police are willing to listen, um, can prove invaluable. And I, and I mentioned also in the book, with the Murder Accountability Project, we um, proposed in the United States and received bipartisan uh, approval, never made it into law, but uh, we're gonna come back and, and try again, uh, the Homicide Victims Families Rights Act, which essentially would allow the families of victims after a period, a prescribed period of 10 years to uh, require the police by way of a motion filed in, in, in state court um, to open up their files to an approved third party, whether it be a, a journalist, whether it be a group like ours, uh, whether it be a, a university think tank, much like the one I run at Western. Well, let me ask you about that. We've got just a couple of minutes left, and I want to get two more questions in. So with that in mind, the Western University Cold Case Society is a think tank that you've founded. And I wonder if you could tell us how successful you've been so far in getting stuff cleared. Well, it depends on the year. Um, I mean, the, our, our, we started in 2011, and that same year, uh, I think, was, is one of our biggest successes, which is, and this is detailed in my book, Mad City, uh, about a, a murder in Madison, Wisconsin, and then a series of connected murders at campuses across the United States. Um, the main suspect in that case uh, was located in New York City after fleeing Madison and absconded from what was supposed to have been uh, a polygraph test in 1968. He had not been seen or heard from since, was presumed to be dead, uh, and my students located him. And um, I mentioned this in my, in my TED talk on this, uh, called him, found a f home phone number and called him and kept him on the phone and elicited uh, a sort of tongue-in-cheek confession. Um, the university, we had to come up with some rules after that. You don't call suspected serial killers if you're an undergraduate student. Um, <laughs> but uh, that really sort of started us off and, and, and demonstrated that uh, we could absolutely move the needle on, on cases using uh, cutting edge technologies, which we've used in a recent case to the, um, 
narrow down where a, a, a body is buried again of a, of a child victim. Uh, and then police have come to us just to peer review their cases before they bring it to the filing district attorney to say, you know, will this hold weight? Uh, Michael, I am saving the most bizarre question for the end here. Okay. Are you ready to go? Hit me up. Do you think you are so fascinated with this topic because your great, great, great uncle was himself a serial killer? I don't think so. Um, Sam Gray, who um, owned the pub in Bally Bay, Ireland, and also was the chief or high constable, so a pub owner who's the chief of police, strange combination. Uh, yeah, we know of, of at least three murders committed by him. Uh, the local legend is that once uh, the York Hotel, which he owned, which was the pub, uh, was sold to new owners, that some bodies were found walled up in the cellar, which was known as the Black Hole among locals because other things happened there. Um, but to be honest, no, my, my interest in this arose from the fact, uh, and this is mentioned in my book, Murder City. As a child, I, I walked the same path as... Um, a boy named Frankie Jensen, who in 1968 was kidnapped and murdered, uh, and the killer never caught, and it was a cold case. Um, and we always wondered, was there someone from the neighborhood, um, especially, I mean, it was a very tight-knit uh, suburban neighborhood, and uh, the fact that he was always still out there spooked every kid who walked that same, that same path, and... Um, really drove my interest in getting into law enforcement and, and getting answers and finding these people. And from there, I realized who this person was and that he was a serial killer. And the reason uh, he wasn't in our neighborhood anymore is because he had uh, moved away to claim victims elsewhere. Gotcha. Well, I told you before we started, this uh, book not only has uh, academic excellence attached to it, but it's also absolutely fascinating for the lay reader, such as yours truly. How to Solve a Cold Case and everything else you wanted to know about catching killers. And it's brought Michael Arntfield to our virtual studio tonight from London, Ontario. Michael, thanks. Good to talk to you again. Thanks, Steve. Good seeing you again, too. On election night, one riding struck out on its own, not choosing a candidate from one of the big provincial parties, but opting instead for an independent candidate. Voters in Haldeman, Norfolk, which spans up from the northeastern shore of Lake Erie, went its own way. They elected Bobby Ann Brady to represent them. That hasn't happened in almost 30 years in Ontario. And Bobby Ann Brady joins us now from Simcoe, Ontario, to tell us how she did it. Hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, we've been buzzing about this interview, and it's so great that you could spend some time with us. So I want to start off uh, with some footage from our own election night coverage. Um, Steve Pakin was so shocked by the votes you were getting, he could barely believe his eyes. Sheldon, please roll. Let's do one more PC problematic writings. I think we got one more. Uh, hold them in Norfolk, right. And, um, well, can that be right? That can't be right. Whoa. Is that right? Yeah. That's wild. Guys, you gotta you gotta check that. Yes, that's it would. to say one of the safest conservative seats in the yeah. province it may not go conservative tonight because the people there were more loyal to Toby Barrett and don't like the way he was screwed over by the Premier's office. It is incredibly rare for an independent to win a seat at Queen's Park. I mean it's happened before, but it's incredibly rare. The Tories get defeated in Holderman Norfolk. Well, some of the language that was used there in reaction, it was wild. And Steve Pakin said that you were screwed over. Um, I, I'd rather say that you were kind of, you were done dirty. But how did that uh, win feel? You became the first independent MPP elected in the province in more than 100 years who hadn't previously run under a party banner. How, are you still processing that feel? I'm still processing it, but I feel grateful. I think that the people of Haldeman Norfolk were extremely courageous going to the ballot box. They were expected to go to the ballot box and tick off one of the top three parties. And they went and they did something that wasn't expected of them. And, you know, I'm just grateful because they've sent a message to all political parties, not just the PC party, but to all political parties that you can't continually disrespect people. You can't take their vote and you can't take their money for granted. 
at some point we stand up and we're counted. And that's what Haldeman Norfolk did. And I'm still so grateful. I'm in awe that so many people went and made that very brave decision. You uh, sir, you had so many uh, mountains to climb in that. And Steve mentioned that you were screwed over. Can you give us a bit of background of what happened in that writing? So in a nutshell, every outgoing MPP uh, was able to either appoint their successor or host a nomination night. As far as I know, Toby Barrett was the only MPP who wasn't afforded one of those options. And it was, was Toby Barrett? Here. Toby Barrett. And Toby yes. Barrett was the person that you were uh, working with. He was the MPP That's right. there. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've worked for Toby for 23 years. So when the premier asked Toby who he would suggest as his successor, Toby said, I would I would pick Bobby and Brady. She's been my executive assistant for 23 years. And the premier got back to Toby and said, she's not our choice and this is who I'm going to appoint. And at that point, Toby said, I can't condone your appointment. Um, you know, this person has never been seen locally as a conservative, hasn't held a membership, hasn't attended events, hasn't donated. We can't, as local conservatives, we can't condone this appointment. And that's when I decided to challenge that. Um, was that an easy thing to do? Because you had been uh, the president of the PC Association in that riding. Was that an easy decision for you to not run with the party, but go off on your own? It wasn't an easy decision at all. Um, it had to be done quickly, but it wasn't an easy one because I, I, I have been the president for over 20 years and I have great friends within the PC party. So this is not about, you know, um, me being upset with the PC party in another stretch of the imagination. It's the fact that the premier did something that the folks in Haldeman Norfolk couldn't support. And people came to me and said, how do we challenge this? And we tried to challenge it in ways by asking for a nomination and the premier's mind was already made up. So I said, there's only one way to challenge it. And so that's when I decided that I was going to run as an independent because that was the only, the only way left for me to challenge it. Um, is it true that you were so under-resourced, you didn't have campaign literature or signs until halfway through the election? So as an independent, you can't begin raising money under any party banner uh, prior to the election. So a candidate can't raise money until the election call is made. But when you run under you know, a, a banner, you can, you can collect money ahead of the election under the party name. As an independent, you have no party. So you can't start collecting money until day one. And uh, that's the position we were in. You can't order items until you have money. Uh, you can't do any transactions. So we, we sat and waited a few days. And, and then when the writ was dropped, we hit the ground running and we waited two, uh, two, I think, weeks for literature and two and a half weeks for signs. And once we got those things, we just, it was like the sign fairies appeared one night and bam, all those signs went up overnight and the money was rolling in. Uh, once we got the literature, we were hitting doors in every community uh, simultaneously. And we won this campaign the old fashioned way by banging on doors. Uh, were you nervous? I mean, it just kind of seems everybody else had more time than you. And then you're doing it, you're trying to play catch up. I wasn't nervous. I was extremely determined. Uh, people said to me, are you doing just this just to prove a point? Or do you actually think you're going to win? And I said, I will win. I said, the, the people of Haldeman and Norfolk are not happy with what has occurred. There's some big issues at play here. I said, I'm not in this just to, um, you know, put in my time. We're going to win this. And uh, I wasn't really nervous. Uh, I think I was just uh, so focused on, on doing all the right things and running the proper campaign. And I just went out every day and, and the time went so fast, but I don't recall being nervous. I was just extremely determined that we were going to, to make things right. I have a picture from election night. You're holding uh, a banana. Why are you holding a banana in the air? Well, it's funny. I see that picture now and it matches my skirt. Um, <laughs> so the banana was given to me on election night because the quote that we used throughout the campaign, and it came from a comment from somebody within the party, and it wasn't said in a way that was malicious, but they just said, you know, Bobby Ann, you should probably just walk away because we could run a monkey and hold them in our folk as long as it has a PC logo on its back and we will win. And so that's where the, the banana comes from. It's for the monkey. Well, how did you take that response? Uh, I, 
was, I felt disrespect. I feel, I feel that the people of Haldeman Norfolk were disrespected in that comment because it's taking them for granted. It's, it's saying, hey, we know that the folks in Haldeman Norfolk are going to go to the ballot box and just check off the PC um, candidate. And I was offended by that as a conservative, as the Riding Association of Pre President. I said, I'm offended by this. And when people in the riding hear this, they will be offended as well. And they were. They felt it was a huge disrespect of Toby and of my work as well. Between Toby and I, we have 50 years of service to the community and to the party. And uh, the community definitely um, respects the work of Toby and I. And uh, they were very, very upset by the the lack of respect from the party or from the premier. What is your win? What's the message that it sends to uh, Premier Doug Ford? I hope it's sending the message that you can't rely on, you know, you can't, you can't think that there's a safe seat anywhere. In politics, we talk about safe seats and we talk about those seats that are traditionally conservative no matter what happens. And I hope the message is, is that you can't just take people for granted. You can't expect them to do what you want them to do all the time. At some point, they realize that they're being perhaps used. And um, I hope that that's the message that is sent to the premier. And I hope he works to clean that up. In fact, I would love to help, um, you know, clean up that culture of disrespect that I've seen for the past while. Um, we know that this election had a really low voter turnout. We, uh, we talked about the message that it sends to the Premier and maybe other politicians. But what message do you think your win sends to voters who might be apathetic towards elections, towards voting, thinking that maybe it doesn't change, doesn't do anything? So that's a really good question. And people have responded to me. They have reached out through private messenger text, people I don't even know, and from right across Ontario and, and elsewhere in Canada as well. And they've said for them, listen, I had lost hope. I, you know, with governance, uh, I had, had grown cynical of leaders, but your campaign serves as hope for us because um, we all take that, that attitude of, oh, you know, why bother? Nothing's going to change. Here's a prime example where if you bother, you can affect change. So people have said, I had lost all hope until I saw that an independent had won in Haldeman, Norfolk. And I truly believe that courage can be contagious. I use that line on the campaign trail all the time. Look, if we go and we do the courageous thing, we can affect change that is so badly needed. And I really do hope that more people get involved in politics and realize that if they just put a little bit of work in and they they fight back, they they can they can make a difference. And and Haldem Norfolk has has set the example, and I'm so so proud of the people here. Well, what's one big message you want to address while at Queens Park? I want to help fix the rural urban divide. Um, you know, I, we see a divide from the left and the right, and we talk about that politically, but there's also a divide um, between the urban and rural people of our province, and there doesn't need to be. I was sitting on a Zoom call the other day, um, and, and I said, you know, it, it's largely media and government who are being blamed, and I don't know if that blame is, is being put in the right place, but the media and the government for the past uh, few years have been the ones in front of the, you know, in front of the people every single day. And the, the folks in my area, a rural area, are very, very hesitant about allowing people from urban areas to come in, develop their land. Uh, they see development happening on agricultural land, productive agricultural land, and they don't like it. They believe that, you know, the city is trying to change their way of life. And then you have um, the, the urban folks who maybe move into an area and believe that the, the rural people don't like them. And we have to fix that divide. It's not healthy for any of us. I, I talk about um, gun ownership, and I know that's not popular in urban areas, but there is this culture and tradition in, in rural Ontario and rural Canada where you know, we fill the freezers by hunting. And yet hunters and farmers are now being targeted 
and told that you know they're bad people because they own guns. That's simply not true. Uh, we've got a, a, a gun issue in this province, but it's not because of our hunters and it's not because of our farmers. So the honesty has to come to the table and and I want to bridge that gap as well. Uh, there's there's urban MPPs who perhaps have food processing plants in their riding, but they don't know that maybe sour cherries from Norfolk County are making it to their food processing plant, you know, north of Toronto or in Toronto. There is a connection there, and we have to make that connection. We're not all that different. We're just being told we're different. And it's driving that wedge. And I, and I want to bring people, just like I would love to bring people from the left and the right closer together, we have to bring people from rural Ontario and urban Ontario closer together as well. And the other the other big issue that I want to work on when I get to Queen's Park is um, there's a ministerial zoning order that has been asked of for a, a large development in our riding in, in Haldeman County. And I want to fight that because uh, there's a plan to, to build a city of 40,000 at the Nanny Coke Industrial Park, and nobody should be li living in an industrial park. So those are two of my, my big top items that I want to address right off the get-go. Um, well, you've officially left the Progressive Conservative Party, but you've, you've been a part of it for decades. Um, is it fair to call you uh, a conservative-minded politician who will bring forward conservative issues at Queen's Park? It's fair to say that I am a conservative and I'll always be a conservative, but I do believe that there is no monopoly on a good idea. I have seen ideas and uh, private members bills brought forward from all stripes. And yet sometimes because of political party lines, those ideas are trashed, they're sidelined. And we have to, we got to do away with that. If there's a good idea, it doesn't matter who brings it forward. If it's good for the people of Ontario, adopt it, you know, embrace it. And we, we have to push for that. So that's another part of the party culture that I, I really want to help change. Because right now what's happening when you're sidelining good ideas just because they come from somebody else, that's not good for you and I. Um, Mike Schreiner has been on this program before, and he's spoken about the importance of him just being there, even if it's just one seat. Um, what do you say to those who are skeptical, your single voice, in a sea of 123 other MPPs who are all backed by political parties that you can make any difference at all? I say watch, wait and watch, because I'm not going to be able to be told to sit down. Somebody's not going to be able to say to me, um, you can't speak about that. What's important to the people of Haldeman Norfolk will make it to the floor of the Ontario legislature, regardless of who in the Ontario legislature wants me to speak about it. So I think that we can bring forward some really good ideas. I think we can talk about things that would probably never be talked about otherwise within the chamber. So I say to those naysayers, I say, just, just wait, give me a chance. And I have friends on all sides of the house. I have colleagues, I have work, you know, that I have worked with um, for 23 years who, you know, have said to me, way to go, Bobby Ann, we're glad you're here and we're going to work with you. So, you know, I, I'm not going to go to Queen's Park and work against Premier Ford every single day. Mm. No, if Premier Ford is doing good things, I will support those good things, but I'll also support good things being done by other um, people in, in the legislature as well. So it's an opportunity for us to um, bring a different culture to politics. And I, I think we can do that. Um, so you have a really fascinating sporting history. Um, is it true that you're a national gold medal winning kickboxing champion? Yes, it is true. Um, it's not as great as it sounds, I don't think, but I, I competed um, nationally a few times and I did win a gold medal at uh, the national level and I did fight uh, in Florida for the World Kickboxing Championships back in 2015 and that was a real eye-opener. But I started martial arts at a, at a late point in my life and if there's any young people out there listening, if, if you want to get involved in a sport that's really good for your mind and your body, uh, get into martial arts. It's helped me in my political career. It's helped me be a, a you know, a better listener, uh, a more calm person, less reactive. Those are all things that you would probably think that, you know, 
kickboxing and karate would maybe make you more reactive, but in your mind, uh, it helps calm your mind and gives you uh, a greater peace. And unless you're a martial artist, you, you probably wouldn't really understand that. So one more thing, because uh, Steve Pickin uh, yesterday said to me that when I do speak to you, that he wants me to ask you something. Is it true that your uh, EA now is going to be uh, former PC MPP Toby Barrett? So uh, Toby. that is actually going around in the media, but no, Toby's, uh, he needs to uh, go off and enjoy his retirement. I don't think he's going very far, but I don't think he's going to be my executive assistant. I think he'll be the institutional knowledge and the, uh, you know, kind of holding my hand as I move through this and, and he's going to help me along, but I'm going to ensure that Toby enjoys his retirement too. <laughs> And it's great, your relationship, how he's mentored you and how you've worked together. It's nice to see. He's a fantastic mentor, and I couldn't have asked for, um, you know, a better boss for the past 23 years. I've learned so much, and I really do feel blessed uh, working for Toby Barrett. Thank you so much, Bobby Ann. It's been a pleasure to speak to you, and we're going to be watching how you shake things up. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Quick question, who's your MPP? Are you sure? Do you even have one? It's been two weeks since the Ontario election, but no one has been sworn in yet. So, are there any MPPs right now? And for that matter, who's governing? Is anyone governing? Such minutia is the delight of Queen's Park watchers and on-poly nerds such as yours truly and Jessica Smith-Cross, the editor-in-chief of QP Briefing and iPolitics, and she joins us now for some answers. Welcome back. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here in the studio. I'm enjoying it myself. Thank you. <laughs> you could. We know that when the lieutenant governor dissolved the last house, there were no more MPPs, right? Everybody's a free agent. But I did get questions. People emailed me questions saying, does that mean Doug Ford's not the premier anymore? So let me ask you, was there ever a time during which Doug Ford was not the premier? No, he stayed the premier and the cabinet stayed the cabinet. If anything major were to happen during the election period, during the caretaker period, they would still be in charge. So if an emergency did come up, you still got the premier and the cabinet on the job, even though they're campaigning to make decisions. Yes. Okay, good to know. How much lobbying for cabinet posts has there been since the election on June the 2nd? Well, I can tell you that Doug Ford does not want to hear that. He made that very clear. Do not lobby me. Do not have your people lobby me. It will not help. It might, in fact, hurt. But we do see in the news, you know, people whispering to, to our reporters, to other reporters, you know, I think this person's a shoe in here. Their track record shows that they'd be a great fit for that, that health, minister, health minister spot that needs to be filled. So that's a form of lobbying. I was always told back in the day that if you talked, you didn't know, and if you knew, you didn't talk. Is that still the way? I think that's wise, and we've heard that too from some of the same people who, who talk a little bit. Hmm. Do, um, let's see, the PCs, they won more seats this time than they did last time. 83 now out of 124 seats. That's a serious majority government. Is the scuttlebutt at Queen's Park now as a result of that bigger mandate that they expect this next Ford government to be even more emboldened than, say, the last one was? I, we might see bold. I'm not sure. I don't think we're going to see this sort of wild days after he was first elected where there were a lot of things happening. Some of it was quite messy and quite controversial. This is a different Ford. A diff there are different people surrounding him who I think make better decisions. So we won't see that kind of chaos that marked his earliest days. So he sort of learned the lesson that that kind of disruptive, you know, crazy populism doesn't really work anymore? No, the four that showed up during the pandemic, who was more measured and who was uh, surrounded by professionals, uh, that did better with the population, I think. Now, we had a very unusual election night in as much as I don't think I can ever recall two party leaders resigning on election night together. Uh, Andrew Horvath, Stephen Del Duca, the NDP and Liberal leader, both announced their intention to leave on election night. Does that suggest that Doug Ford is going to have an easier ride certainly in the first year of this new mandate because the two opposition leaders are leaving. You can say that they might be a little bit focused on internal party matters, but there may also be leadership candidates who want to make their mark and they want to do it by taking big old swings at the premier. So we could have a, we could have a very interesting early days for this government. So he shouldn't necessarily think that he's going to have a free reign in the first year or so. No, I think there'll be some, some serious criticism lobbied his way by the people who'd like to lead the opposition parties. Hmm. All right, a new crop of MPPs is going to be sworn in soon. 
Do they receive, the newbies, do they receive some kind of orientation at Queen's Park to show them where the bathrooms are and the caucus rooms and all this business? They do. 36 of them went to uh, Queen's Park on Wednesday morning to get shown around and understand this place that they're going to be going to. Do you know what kind of pep talk they get? I wasn't privy to that, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I was. Because I heard that up on Parliament Hill, and, and I, th this again is old news. This, this happened to an MP who told me about it from, say, 20 years ago. They said, look around. By the time your political careers are over, two-thirds of you are going to be divorced. Oh, wow. Because public life can be tough on families. And I just, I, I wonder and I hope that they get the, don't forget about home life. I know, like, because the political career can be pretty intoxicating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I don't know if they get that speech. They should get that speech if they don't get that speech. For those MPPs who either lost or did not run again, how much time are they given to sort of clean up their stuff and get out. I asked an MPP who didn't run again, uh, Suze Morrison. She told me she had 10 days from the writ drop to uh, clear out her office space, and she thinks that the the folks who didn't who did win, uh, who sorry who did run but didn't win, have a similarly short period of time to get to get out of Queens Park. So t t this is 10 days from the time the writs are drawn up. Oh, sorry, I the, the cardinal <laughs> sin. I think of that every time I, I think of you every time I say that. And you just said it again. I did. That's okay. We'll forgive you one. We always give everybody one. Uh, but the, the 10 days has passed, so they should all be gone by now, right? Yes. Theoretically? Okay, good. Now, the budget. We remember the budget was introduced April 28th, but it was never passed because the election writs were drawn up and off to the hustings they went. The Conservatives at first said, we are going to reintroduce the exact same budget we introduced when the House comes back. Mm -hmm. That is no longer the plan, is it? That is no longer the plan. Uh, there is an increase to ODSP rates, a small one, uh, that will be... Disability support. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, that will be in the reintroduced budget. Uh, the Premier also left some room for other small tweaks that were undefined that we may learn some more about soon. Any guesses at what that might be? I don't know. I think you might want to do something regarding inflation. It's on everybody's mind. If there needs to be an adjustment for other supports because of inflation, that could be something he's thinking about, but I don't know. I haven't actually heard what his, uh, what his planning. That's a closely guarded secret. It's interesting that they spent so much time saying, elect us and we will reintroduce this exact same budget. But then during the campaign, they actually came out with an increased Ontario Disability Support Program plan. Do we know why they did that? Uh, Corey Tanaik, a uh, key advisor to Doug Ford, just said that was a miss. That was something they'd gotten wrong and should have done, and now they're doing it. Hmm. Now, we also know that when the legislature is dissolved, there are oftentimes a bunch of bills on what they call the order paper that did not get passed in time and therefore disappear. It's not to say they can't be called back in the next session. Do we know whether that's the plan to call back some of those bills that didn't make it last time next time? You know, I looked into that and the, the government did a very good job of getting through its agenda aside from the budget bill, which is obviously huge. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the NDP has a, a bill that they want to reintroduce and it's very important to them. That's the Our London Families Act. It's uh, anti-racism measures uh, in honor of the family that was, the Muslim family that was killed in London. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the government's agenda though, they got everything through they wanted to get through, so they're kind of going in with a clean slate. They are. If there were other opposition bills that got introduced last time but didn't get through, they're certainly entitled to bring them back now, aren't they? They are. And they, prob they probably will, mm -hmm. if oh. they can. Okay, I gotta ask you about turnout. Sure. A lot of people have been talking about turnout, 43.5%, worst ever. I guess a number of us have been asking a lot of different people what interpretation we should draw from such a low turnout. What are you hearing? Everyone I've talked to about this sort of agrees on the same fundamentals that people were just battered by the pandemic, by a tough economic time, inflation. I mean, if you were going on social media halfway through the election, you would see photos of children who'd been killed in the shooting in Texas. There's a lot of bad news going on, scary news going on, not to mention, you know, Russia and Ukraine, that it's understandable to me that people would not find Ontario politics the thing that is deserving of their attention right now. I, you know, I live it, but that's not everybody, and I, I can understand that. Right. How about, I mean, I'm going to throw a bunch of different interpretations your way. You tell me if, if you've heard this as well. A lack of confidence in, in politics in general, and maybe in the government in particular, didn't bring a lot of people out. Is that possible? Yeah, I think it was, I'm not... This isn't time my radar. I'm not very angry at the government. I don't need to kick the bums out, excuse the phrase, on public television. Um, and that's why there was a, a, a small turnout. I'm satisfied enough with them. 
I heard that too. I heard a lot of people say, I'm content. It doesn't really matter to me too much about who wins. I'm content with whatever happens. So we shouldn't necessarily interpret it as a complete loss of faith in politics in general. It's just they got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, interesting. Uh, are you back at the legislature now? Yes. You're back doing your thing? Yeah. What do you watch? I mean, obviously nobody's been sworn in yet, so what, what's going on? Why to be back in the building? Yeah. Well, my colleagues are there. We, our office is in the legislature, so we work together. <laughs> and is there anything actually happening down there yet? We're always on the scuttlebutt on the, uh, the leadership election, so the, the interim leaders and then the leadership elections for the NDP and the Liberals were focused pretty intently on that and wondering who might be in cabinet if, when the cabinet shuffle comes. And are you getting any sense yet about when, I mean, we've got two vacancies coming up for the two main opposition parties. Any mm -hmm. sense about how quickly or not they want to fill those vacancies? No official word yet at all. I think they might take their time. Hmm. What about COVID protocols down at Queen's Park? Uh, we famously remember that one MPP was ushered out of the chamber because she wasn't wearing a mask. Is that still the case? Uh, there's no more screening and there's no more mask mandate. So everybody's okay to come and go as they please now. I don't know if they've changed the uh, the vaccinated the vaccination. Oh, policy. okay, interesting. Yeah. So you might still have, MVPs, to have yeah. you might still have to be vaccinated to get in there, because that is the case with obviously a lot of other employees. Elsewhere. Yeah, for MP for MPPs, I don't know yet. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Any scuttlebutt about who's going to be the next minister of whatever? You hearing anything? Well, the minister of health is the most interesting one because right. uh, Christine Elliott has retired. So we've had a little bit of. Like we talked about before, people whispering some names who might be good. One of them is uh, Sylvia Jones, who was Solicitor General. But that, that's not a sure thing by any means. I, it's not a sure thing, but I read it in your publication. So it's got to be. I mean, I can take that to the bank if I read it in your newsletter, right? Yep, Charlie Pinkerton got that one. Yeah. <laughs> good, good job, Charlie. That's Jessica Smith-Cross, QP Briefing, iPolitics. We're grateful to have you actually back in our studio again, Jessica. Thanks. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Thursday, June 16th, 2022. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka talks to writer Michelle Orange about her new memoir of life growing up with a career-minded mother whose choices she didn't quite understand. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.